Okay. Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. Today is July 13th, 2021. I'm Steve Shields, president of the Royal Asiatic Society, Korea. On behalf of the officers and council, I welcome you to our lecture. By way of reminder, lecture content does not necessarily reflect the opinions or position of Royal Asiatic Society Korea. The Royal Asiatic Society traces its beginnings to India in the late 1700s and was formally chartered in London in 1824 by King George IV. The Royal Asiatic Society of Great Britain and Ireland granted a charter to the Korea branch in 1900, the fourth year of the Gwangmu Emperor of Korea. RAS Korea expresses sincere thanks to our generous sponsor, Asia Development Foundation, for their continuing support. We especially thank our members who have paid their annual dues. Your dues provide essential primary funding for RAS Korea. Without your membership, we would not be able to host the lecture series. We'd love to have you join us if you're not a member. It only takes a few minutes to sign up and membership gives you the opportunity to support the world's first and oldest Korean studies organization. For 120 year, 21 years, we have strived to explore and promote all facets of Korea's heritage. Members receive our annual journal, Transactions, uh, members are also recognized reciprocally by most of Asia's RAS affiliated societies, as well as the London based original RAS. See our website at raskb.com for details. I'll post a link in the chat box shortly. If you're not a member, we request a one time admission fee. You can refer to the chat box that I'll post in a minute that talks about that with PayPal and bank transfer information. We are joined tonight from uh, uh, London, I, I presume, London environ somewhere by Dr. Cameron Pike and Soki Nam. Dr. Pike is a historian with an interest in the education of children with special educational needs, including the methodology of Karl Orff and Gunild Kiefman, Kiefman. In addition to an interest in Korea, he has published on Benjamin Britten's Russia Connection. Solki Nam is a PhD student at SOAS in London, supervised by Dr. Anders Carlson. She is researching the Anglican church and social welfare work in Korea in the early 20th century. They will discuss with us tonight the work of Princess Yvonne Jha of Korea whose Japanese name was Nashimoto Masako, uh, her firsthand involvement in the education of children with physical and mental disabilities in Korea, and a conscious self-identification as a volunteer took place over the last 25 years of her life, following her return to her adopted country in 1963. After the lecture, there will be time for questions, so I would ask you to mute your Mikes and welcome Dr. Pike and Ms. Nam. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm just going to share my screen, uh, which is here. Can, can you all see that? Is that okay? So can you, can you see that? Is that all right? Uh, let me just do slideshow and just one minute. Uh, okay, can you can you see that? Is that all right? Looks very good. Thank you. That's lovely. Thank you. Well, thank you, Reverend Steve, for your kind words and for the honour of the invitation to give this webinar for the Royal Asiatic Society of Korea. I just wish that uh, we could be with you in person. Uh, both Sulki and I are particularly grateful for the encouragement of the Society for this research project, including to John as editor of the Transactions, and also to the late Peter Bartholomew. Peter and I had a number of memorable conversations about his first-hand dealings with members of the Korean royal family, to which we could perhaps return in the Q&A. 
And I should say it's been a privilege to co-author this piece with Nam Sulgi, a gifted Korean scholar who's just successfully upgraded after her first year of a PhD at SOAS. Her ability to identify and access Korean source material is coupled with a generous historical empathy, which is perhaps particularly required for this topic. I'll deliver the formal paper and then Sulgi will be glad to join me to answer any questions. Let me begin with a very brief overview of the life of Princess Yi Panja of Korea. Born into a collateral branch of the Japanese royal family in 1901, she was selected by the Japanese authorities to marry Yi Eun, Crown Prince Oimin of Korea, a highly contentious political project. Following her marriage in 1920, she gave birth to two sons, the first of whom, Yi Jin, died in infancy on a visit to Seoul in 1922. Her subsequent first-hand experience of Korea during the colonial period was predominantly mediated through Japanese imperial rule. Following the Japanese defeat in 1945, Yi Panja and Yi Un in what transpired as a marriage of genuine mutual affection, were downgraded to commoner status in Japan by the American occupying authorities and following the declaration of the Republic and subsequent election of Syngman Rhee as president in 1948, they were viewed with official hostility in Korea. In a final twist, the new government of Pak Chung-hee began arrangements to naturalize Yi Panja and Yi Eun in 1961, overseeing their return to Korea in 1963. By this stage, he was permanently incapacitated and would predecease his wife in 1970. It's at this point, ironically, that the most remarkable final chapter of her life began, her voluntary first-hand involvement in the education of children with physical and mental disabilities in Korea and a self-identification and a Korean volunteer in the social voting. This area we'll be exploring this evening. The first slide you'll just see is from a Japanese book. Uh, My own interest in this subject is partly historical and partly personal and was first inspired by a number of visits to the royal tombs. You'll see on the, uh, the, the first slides are the, the tombs of uh, Yi Panja and Yi Eun, and uh, likewise viewed from the, uh, the top of the, uh, the complex. And at a different time of year, that this is the tomb of Princess Toki. And you will see here a, a representation of the tomb of uh, Yi Eun's uh, mother on the left and their first uh, son on the right. The personal dimension of Yi Panja and her sister-in-law, Princess Toke, both intrigued and moved me. President Park had overseen the return of both royal, royal ladies to Korea in 1962 to three and they lived at opposite ends of the Naksonje compound in Chandokung Palace. Princess Toke living, as Peter described in semi, to me, in semi-isolation from the world. She did make appearances for the annual ceremonies at Jongmo Sh Shrine, but was in a sense uh, uh, divorced from, from the world. In fact, predeceased Ipanja by only perhaps not too fanciful to think that Ipanja felt a protective duty to wait until her younger relation had been released from this world. Whilst these royal obsequies did not receive any mention in the British press, unlike the considerable coverage of the death and funeral of Showa Emperor earlier that year, they equally represented the end of an historical chapter. After 1989, a full-scale program of restoration was undertaken at Naksonje, culminating in the demolition of Yi Panja's colonial era residence. This is uh, what her residence uh, looked like. 
and uh, you see that it was actually situated on the very left of this slide. Another image uh, there. This was taken just actually as the pandemic uh, began to happen. So you'll see there weren't many people uh, in the compound. Another image there for you. Uh, and you, you see, I've, I've tried to give a sense of where Ipanja's residence uh, was. That's a slide, I think, from the funeral of Eun in 1970. Moreover, Ipanja's surviving son, Igu, was not involved in her foundations. Her life's work then represents something of a one-off. There were three distinctive accomplishments to Ipanja's work after 1963. The first was the setting up of Myong Hiwon in 1968, a vocational training center for the disabled named after her husband's childhood pen name. It was initially based on the fourth floor of Seoul's YMCA before acquiring its own building, which opened in 1971 as Myong Hall, a combination of the childhood names of both Ipanja and Eun. By 1978, it catered for 20 pupils of both sexes in each of its four courses, knit work, embroidery, woodcraft, and electronics. The majority of its pupils were from pure, uh, poor families or for whom tuition and materials were free so that although there was a board of directors, the bulk of the funding was orchestrated by Ipanja herself. She also facilitated public performance opportunities in dance and music for some of its students. This reflected the increasingly recognized therapeutic benefits of the creative arts and prefigured the setting up of the Korea Orf Schulwerk Association in 2004. In its current location in Chonggi province, Myonghe Won not only serves as a school, but also supports disabled workers and the mentally ill. There it is today. And you'll see that it's run under the aegis of the uh, Catholic Church, uh, the Sisters of Perpetual Help. Ipanja's second achievement focused on the promotion of the welfare of children with mental health issues. Through the Cha Hengue, the Benevolent Deeds Association she launched in 1966, this work developed from a small rehabilitation center into the partly state-funded Cha He School, also now in Chonghi province, which opened, opened in 1971. Uh, this here, you'll see this is the symbol, uh, sorry, I've, I've actually uh, gone on there. This is, that's the symbol of Myonghe Won. I just wanted to show that, that she designed, she designed the symbol uh, of that organization. It's clearly a very, uh, a very personal project for her. Sorry, back to Chahe School. The association also attempted to influence wider attitudes. It funded research and teacher training and encouraged parents, designers and performers to visit the school and engage with students and their creative work. This vision was developed by the outstanding educator Kim Jong-guk as principal from 1979 onwards. He previously established the first special school for mentally disabled children in Korea and would go on to develop a comprehensive special needs curriculum across the country. A couple of photographs um, that Sulky took when she visited the school uh, back in uh, December to show the, in the interesting uh, emphasis uh, on, um, on, on, on cooking. Um, it's not only this focus on special educational needs, which is dis a distinctive achievement, but also Ipanja's wider contribution to the development of volunteering in modern Korea particularly amongst female social activists, social welfare activists. This was partly born out of a long-standing belief that volunteering is necessary for the cohesion of society. But after her return to Korea in 1963, this was also a matter of necessity as well as conviction in that government funding wasn't provided for her social welfare projects. She utilized the skill in Poisine, which she'd acquired through expert instruction in Tokyo from 1954, 
enabling her to draw upon a high-end market for its products amongst Japanese, Koreans, and the expatriate community. Let me share uh, a couple of images of one of her pieces of work. This is uh, a piece which is in the Bodleian Library in Oxford. It's part of the Richard Rutt collection. Uh, and I had the great pleasure of handling this last week. And this was a gift from Ipanja to Joan Rutt for editing the English version of The World Is, is One. And there's the, there's the, um, the reverse of the dish. Following her return to Korea, Ipanja undertook further instruction from Iwa Women's University in the authentic reproduction of royal garments for charity events. You'll see some of them here, uh, including the uh, pinyo. As the number of Japanese tourists to Korea increased after the normalization of relations in 1965, those invited to the ritual of tea ceremony in her private quarters at Naksonje were encouraged to contribute to her social welfare work through purchasing her paintings and calligraphy. Uh, this is a piece that uh, she gave to Horace Grant Underwood the second. You'll actually see it's on the wall behind me. That's a, a long story. Ipanja's croisonné calligraphy and painting were also sold at charity bazaars and out of shops in the arcades of the Toku Hotel in Seoul and in Tokyo. When one reads the press of, of this period, the number of bazaars uh, she attended, it was a, clearly a huge um, part of, uh, of, of life in Seoul uh, at that time. This all required a disciplined schedule of calligraphy and drawing at the start of the day, cloisonné classes in her studio, managerial meetings and hands-on social welfare work. This relatively high profile role as a female volunteer was not straightforward. Some initially believed that Ipanja had hidden assets as a member of the royal family. While some of her supporters regarded her appearances as a model in fundraising royal court costume shows as compromising her dignity. Defining herself in public after 1963 as unequivocally Korean and plain Mrs. Panja E, and wearing hanbo when attending receptions and participating in television appearances and E Dynasty heritage events to raise funds, demanded a willingness to live out a public role. Uh, there's some, uh, she designed her own clo clothes, Western style clothes there, but I wanted to show you uh, her uh, handball uh, design, uh, and you'll know the, the famous cover of The World is One. She also undertook fundraising visits to communities of first generation Koreans on the west coast of the United States, as in 1974, and to members of the Japanese business community. Between 1965 and 1986, Cha Heng was in fact a binational project drawing upon the support of an elite circle of female supporters galvanized by E. Panja herself. In all of these activities, her sustained hands-on engagement as a volunteer radically under, undercut the role of the aristocratic woman defined by the Confucian social order. I should just say that's just a, sign, a signed copy of The World Is One and you'll see how she signed herself. And that's, uh, that's a co another copy with her, uh, with her business card in it. In doing this, her autobiography suggests that she may have drawn some inspiration from the Dowager Empress of Japan, who had defined a meaningful role for herself against the deterioration of her husband, Emperor Taisho's health and the rise of Japanese militarism through devoting her energies to support those suffering from leprosy. This offered a powerful counter narrative of personal survival, transcending the conventional miserable lot of royal women. In a little way, I thought it was interesting that she herself inherited Ian's royal seals as crown prince. Sulky and I were particularly interested to explore the uh, motivation and context for these act activities. 
relatively little historical work has been done in this area, particularly outside Korea and Japan. Professor Christine Kim's work has explored the photographic imagery of the monarchy during the colonial period, and also noted its significant degree of residual support after 1945, suggesting that the new republic rapidly occupied this space, thereby making a return of the royal family members after 1960, both possible and politically desirable as an additional but non-threatening source of legitimacy. This achieves striking affirmation in the officially endorsed large-scale ceremonial for Yi Eun's funeral in 1970. There are some interesting parallels here with the monarchies of Eastern Europe after 1989, whose members have largely been co-opted by the successor Republican regimes into charitable and heritage activity, as in Yugoslavia and Romania. Professor Faye Kleeman's book, In Transit, usefully goes beyond narratives of collaboration and victimhood by examining the wider genre of 20th century female autobiography in Northeast Asia. This is particularly helpful in Ipanja's case because there were at least seven editions of it between 1960 and 1985, including, of course, the, the celebrated English version of 1973. There's a further parallel here with the various editions of the autobiography of the last Chinese emperor, Pu Yi, culminating in the bestseller From Emperor to Citizen of 1964, in that both texts project a narrative of atonement and enlightenment. For Pu Yi as a gardener and model citizen, and for Yi Panja through social welfare work. At least Yi Panja was spared re education. However, whilst we know a certain amount about the Pu Yi autobiographical project and the high level support for it from Premier Zhou Enlai, Yi Panja's voice is more elusive. We therefore employed a wider range of sources. Firstly, Japanese and Korean newspapers from the 1950s onwards. What is striking here is the significant degree of accumulated media coverage of her social welfare work. Secondly, the English national and provincial press for August to September 1927. This enables one to reconstruct the program of her and EU's visits to the UK uh, in, in detail, to the UK in detail, in tandem with Shinoda Osamusaku's diary of the visit published the following year. Thirdly, we received assistance from the two educational foundations themselves, whose memorial halls are well worth a visit. And this included access to the journals of Cha Hengue Association and to some of her private photograph albums. The Research Association of Korean Church History for the Archdiocese of Seoul was also very helpful. And finally, we were in touch with several people who had dealings with Yi Panja. For example, a lady whose mother attended Hong Kiryo, a dormitory set up by her in 1940 to accommodate female graduates from the Royal Educational Foundations in Seoul studying in Tokyo. The motivation for Ipanja's social welfare activity has received little attention beyond her own categorization of it as the fulfillment of her late husband's wishes. We would choose to highlight the following three areas. Firstly, the impact of her visit to London in 1927 as part of the extensive European tour she and Eun undertook in 1927 to 28. This here is a page from George V's uh, diary recording uh, the meeting he and Queen Mary had with the Korean couple. And you'll notice the line, the, and the Japanese ambassador came with them. Queen Mary's, uh, an extract from Queen Mary's diaries on, on the left and also the award uh, the, uh, the investiture of, uh, of, of the Korean Crown Prince. 
The most distinctive uh, feature of the visit was the first-hand encounter with a range of social welfare projects. At a time when the presentation of the British monarchy as a cohesive force through its support for social welfare was at its height, not least in the aftermath of the general strike of the previous year. The programme of social welfare visits for the Korean couple included St. Bartholomew's Hospital in central London, which prided itself as the mother hospital of the empire, with the Prince of Wales as its patron. And this, in, this very much embodied the royal family's support for the voluntary hospital sector. Queen Mary's Hospital for uh, a range of limb patients, including those wounded in the First World War, and also children uh, with limb conditions. Dr. Bernardo's Girls Village Home and Boys Garden City. These were the charity's uh, showpieces to the east of London. And finally, uh, a Docklands settlement in the East End. Uh, I wanted to give you a couple of images from the press. Uh, you'll, see, you'll see them on the bottom, bottom left, looking very elegant. Uh, and this, the, the, uh, the picture on the right is an image from the, uh, the Sheffield Telegraph. Uh, and this here is an image of uh, Dr. Bernardo's, uh, Dr. Bernardo's home. The, the essence there was that the girls would be trained uh, for a career in domestic service. But this is perhaps the most the most interesting uh, press article, and uh, I love the uh, I love the reference to the two small boys having a spirited boxing match. All of these facilities were designed to help the deserving poor elevate themselves from lifelong poverty, and reflected the new liberalism which had influenced attitudes in this area since the turn of the century and actually prefigured the celebrated beverage report on which the National Health Service came to be based. This seems to have had a particular influence on Ipanja's insistence on educating the disabled and mentally ill in utilitarian as well as moral terms. Photograph of her here. Um, and this philosophy would be powerfully represented by a bronze statue of self-reliance standing alongside a declaration of the rights of children at Chahi school. My grandmother's brother was born with Down syndrome in 1920. He received no education or training whatsoever and was officially registered as incapacitated in the census of 1939. I say that because Ipanja would have regarded that as a tremendous waste of potential, both individually and also for society. The 1927 visit was, of course, also a political demonstration through the couple of a Korean-Japanese harmony through visits to military and industrial establishments, as in the image you saw of the Sheffield Press. How the impact of this played out in Seoul in the medium term during the years of Japanese occupation is perhaps the most elusive part of this question. Saito Makoto, Governor General of Korea from 1919 to 27 and 1929 to 31, seems to have promoted the European tour as part of the evolution of the crisis concept thought, reinforcing what he saw as the more progressive element of Korea in the face of Korean separatism and or international Bolshevism. He'd already overseen the world couple's first visit to Seoul in 1922 and was in London for part of their visit in 1927. Against this backdrop and residing in Tokyo, it is difficult to determine what, if any, agency the crown prince and princess had or chose to employ in a colonial context they surely assumed would endure indefinitely. Indeed, it was Rhee's assessment that this period represented high level collaboration as opposed to inescapable acquiescence in the emasculation of the E monarchy, which would later delay their return to Korea. 
Ipanjau's autobiography, first compiled as the political situation began to change in 1960, sheds relatively light, little light on this question. In terms of social welfare, such activity seems to have been given some expression during a series of annual visits to Seoul, which took place following the death of Emperor Sunyong in 1926, lasting about 10 days and continuing until 1943. Whilst the frequency of these visits is exaggerated in the annual reports compiled in English by the Japanese authorities, and research remains to be done on the substance of what Ipanja later described as a strenuous round of royal duties. Several photographs certainly suggest that prior to Minami Jiro's assumption of the governor generalship in 1937, the royal couple were engaged in royal duties which appear to have been packaged on Western lines. The conception of a joint royal audience in particular seems drawn from the United Kingdom model and represents a radical break with Chosun Protocol in which Yi Pan Jia as Chun Zhon would not have entered the domain of the king nor entertained his guests. This formula was adapted in Yi Pan Jia's visits to her social welfare projects 40 years later. And in that it was never realized it is poignantly represented in the two wooden chairs for Yi Eun and herself in Myong Won's current memorial hall. Whilst this activity could be seen as endorsing the wider politically motivated educational drive of the colonial authorities, it also continued the educational patronage of members of the House of Yi from the late 19th century. The royal couple, we are told in The World is One, conceived a grand plan to open a magnificent student hall for the three schools founded by Yi Eun's mother, Imperial Consort Sun Hyon, Lady Om. The second important influence took place in Japan after The years 1945 seem to have represented the greatest personal crisis for Yi Pan Jia since the death of her first son, with the incarceration of her father for alleged war crimes and the removal of role privileges in both Korea and Japan. Her social welfare work at this stage was redirected to charitable clubs organized by dedicated ladies to help and educate orphans, mentally disabled children and paralyzed children. This partly reflected a wider broadening in, in the 1950s of imperial charitable activity beyond the wartime focus of the International Red Cross. This was significantly extended by Crown Prince Akihito and his wife Michiko following their marriage in 1959. As part of the Tokyo Olympics of 1964, they adopted the Paralympics and increasingly made helping the physically disabled one of their signature causes. The difference with previous charitable efforts by the Imperial House was that they went to particular efforts to bring the physically disabled into the mainstream of Japanese society as much as possible, rather than sending donations so that they would be comfortable in institutions, but essentially hidden. It's likely then that Yi Panja would have continued to have engaged in aristocratic fundraising in Japan in this area until her death, had not the overthrow of Ri in 1960 made a permanent return to Korea a realistic possibility. Finally, it's very, it's very intriguing that the specific focus on special educational needs only occurred following her return to Korea and was not uncontentious. It appears that Yi Panja initially envisaged a more conventional patronage role along the lines of Princess Pat Chanju, uh, bottom left of the slide. The death of the latter's husband, Yi Wu, second son of Yi Kang, in the atomic bombing of Hiroshima, seems to have underscored an affinity between the two women. 
Packard remained in Korea, retained legal possession of her late husband's Unhyon Palace, very near to Naksonje, as you know, and become the first chairman of Chuge University of Arts, Chunan Girls High School, and Chuge Elementary School. Ipanja initially hoped to become the new chair of the governing board of Sunmyon. This had been founded as Myon Shinje by Yi mother in 1906 and encompassed both a girls' school and a vocational school. Ipanja served as their governor during the colonial period. It had been raised to university status in 1955. However, this embroiled her in a factional dispute at the board level in which new directors opposed to her assuming this role prevailed. In the light of this, the only thing left was social work. This path was both challenging and fortuitous. Existing provision for children with special educational needs and disabilities had largely focused on the blind and deaf and was very limited overall. In 1971, the first principal of Chahe School stated that there are about 180,000 children with mental disabilities in, in Korea. And only 700 of them are receiving special education. The difference of society or family, the fundamental reason is that there are very few educational institutions in Korea to teach them. An editorial in the Korea Times two years later went even further. It wrote, the fact that the government has lacked even the most basic statistics on these ill-fated children shows that they have been virtually left out of public concern. To a degree, in the emerging post-1963 context, there was a complementary circle of influences at play, both present and historical. The initial association of Myung Hee Won with the YMCA reflected the support of the E dynasty for its promotion of Western style vocational education. Mm -hmm. Lee Un himself, having represented Emperor Kojong at the cornerstone ceremony of the original building in 1907. It may also be that a longer term religious impulse increasingly underpinned this social welfare activity. Yi Un had converted to Catholicism in 1961. After her return to Korea, Yi Pan Jia came to enjoy a cordial relationship with Cardinal Stepan Kim Suwan, who baptized her as a Catholic in 1983. Indeed, as I said earlier, since 1985, for Kim's arbitration, Yong Hee Won had been run by the Sisters of Our Lady of perpetual help. As with all research, there are unanswered questions, and I'd like to suggest five. Firstly, how mediated is the narrative of Yi Panja's autobiography? And does the diary upon which it appears to be based still exist? Secondly, what was the substance of the annual visits to Seoul during the colonial period, and how should they be assessed? Thirdly, what was Pak's motivation for allowing Yi Panja's return in 1963? Certainly, he made public the photographs of his receiving Yi Panja in June 1962, and it may be that he envisaged a social welfare role for her as complementing the activities of his wife, Yi Guangsu. Indeed, the, the official opening of Cha He School in 1972, which the First Lady attended, was only able to take place because of her substantial personal donation of 10 million won. Fourthly, why did Yi Panja agree to return in 1963 in contrast to the fall of 1945? And finally, the inspiration for the royal couple's conversion to Catholicism. Now I summarize this address with three thoughts. To set, up two to set up two foundations in the area of special education needs was indeed pioneering. 
distinguishing the work from near contemporaneous royal philanthropists such as Princess Grace of Monaco. In some ways, it prefigures wider shifts in, for example, the United Nations International Year of Disabled per of Persons in 1981 and the holding of the Summer Paralympics in Seoul in 1988. Secondly, the eventual convergence of the various influences I've outlined was not perhaps as straightforward as suggested by the various versions of Ipanja's autobiography. The financial viability of her projects remained a constant struggle. And there were also unrealized plans to support the elderly and the victims of the atomic bombings before she progressively succumbed to cancer after 1983. In one of her final press interviews, she reflected, the social welfare project has been frustrating, embarrassing and desperate for more than 20 years since it started. A colleague who set up a special needs school in London as late as 1987, emphasizes that there was no interest from the government to help us financially or in terms of advice in navigating the regulations. The fact that Ipanja was successful is testimony to her ability to achieve high level political, practical and financial backing, coupled with sheer tenacity and a striking ability to spot talent and to draw upon the expertise of others. When she visited the United States in 1973, for example, she noted that their institutions were intensively teaching children with disabilities to make simple electrical appliances. I thought I could apply these ideas in South Korea. Taken as a whole, Ipanja's life represents a transformation whereby her first-hand involvement in the colonial period was recast from an anti-fairy tale, to use Professor Kleeman's term, into a worthwhile life of self-giving service, hence our title. Let us not forget that this is also the story of a sensitive and gifted creative artist, a poet, painter, and multifaceted designer, as well as a mother and wife. The current Associate Professor of Korean History at Oxford, who met her at an RAS career garden party in 1984, recalls not only that she spoke in fluent French to the French ambassador, but that she was a very impressive person, extremely gracious, poised and worldly. When one works on an historical figure, there are some things one ultimately can never know. Just occasionally one catches a glimpse of her inner life, her self-identification with Princess Diana in an interview with Carol Thatcher in 1983. She said, different culture, but almost similar. Her autobiography's outrage at, I quote, the violent death of her first son and the hateful treatment meted out to Princess Toki. But perhaps above all, the uninhibited joy she radiates when visiting the children of her foundations. These are some of her personal possessions. And you will see there, I wanted to show you this, uh, no, her notebook, and you'll see how, um, how the design uh, was transferred to the, the porcelain vase on the right. We were left with a sense of a remarkable woman and also a feeling that in her commitment to the welfare of children with physical and mental disabilities, a sublimation of personal trauma was at work. Any transformation was therefore a complex and a hard one one. Thank you. Cameron, thank you very much. Uh, folks, uh, Cameron and uh, Ms. Nam will entertain any and all questions. So if you want to use the raise hand function in the corner of the window, we can do that. If you just want to unmute and pop in, we'll try and get everybody to have a chance to ask and uh, engage in conversation.
We have a talkative group tonight, I can see. Um, Cameron, let, let me uh, ask, I, I did a, a piece in the Korea Times so a year or so back about uh, Lee Eun as Korea's forgotten 28th king. Um, when his brother, Emperor Sun Jung, died, Lee Eun was elevated to the kingship in a ceremony at Changduk Palace and was referred to in the Japanese newspapers and the Korean newspapers as His Majesty King E uh, on when he made his visits and whatever. What, what's your assessment of that sort of a reference, at least internal to Korea, whereas at the same time they're going to London and being referred to as the prince? I, th I think it's a it's it's a very interesting uh, question um, and ambiguous. I I I'd, I'd say I might mean, be very interested to know more about the details of that ceremony that you mentioned. Just as um, you know, I mentioned the annual visits. I would say also um, uh, the world is one. Ipanja's autobiography is. It's a fascinating text because unlike the Puyi work I mentioned, there, there are several places where one, one, one's almost given the opportunity to read between the lines. And, and she's rather ambiguous on that topic. She, she says several times that the monarchy had ended. But then she says, actually, you know, he, he was still accorded the, the prerogatives to, you know, due to a king. Um, so I, I can't give you a specific answer, but I think it's a very, I think it's a very, very interesting and important area. I think all I would say is, um, having read some of the annual reports that I mentioned in English, it does strike me that the um, Japanese authorities were very astute in how they uh, messaged and tailored the message to different audiences, mm. which would perhaps explain that ambiguity. Yeah. Um, I think certainly when when the royal couple came to uh, came to the UK, of, of course it was very tightly controlled by the Japanese embassy. But you do sense they had a bit more freedom than other points in the in the tour when they went to the rest of Europe. Um, you know, they were able to go to the theatre. He played a lot of golf, um, uh, actually, and they went to various art exhibitions. Um, but I think it, I think it's a very interesting question. I think the whole role of the monarchy uh, during the colonial period is fascinating. And what I tried to do in writing this article was uh, to go beyond the sense, you know, conventional narratives of co co collaborational victimhood. I, 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 that's why, in a sense, I was very interested to focus on the special, the social welfare aspect. Yeah, the the collaboration issue is really, in my opinion, quite dicey. Uh, are you a collaborator when you just simply say, this is the way things are, we've got to survive? Um, certainly there's overt collaboration where somebody actively pursues, you know, that relationship. But that whole um, colonial era has become so politicized. It's sometimes difficult in my mind to kind of sort out, you know, what, what were people really trying to accomplish? I mean, not all Koreans were feeling oppressed and abandoned. There, there were people living their lives, going to work, feeding their families. Um, it's really challenging period of time. And, and perhaps on that, I, 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 I re recall the fact that my previous work on, on um, Benjamin Britten and Shostakovich in particular uh, helped me really because when Shostakovich died in 1976, you know, he was very much regarded as an official Soviet composer. And then in the publication of Testimony in 1978, he was then regarded as a dissident. Right. Um, and, and there've been tremendous academic disputes about, about that. But I think in some ways, you know, anybody living under the Soviet system had to collaborate, mm. uh, certainly under Stalin. And that's not to say that in, in his greatest music, you know, he was able to uh, transcend that and, and show some sort of personal statement. And I think I'd probably say that, you know, human beings, human beings can perhaps operate on different levels at different times in their lives. 
Miss Nam, I have a, oh, uh, go ahead, Samuel, unmute and ask your question. Yep. You need to unmute. We can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry about that. There we go. Great. Yeah, um, please go ahead. Thank you so much for joining us, Professor. Um, I was curious when Pak Cheng He invited them, the royals back, um, were they given any um, government funding by the state of South Korea for their maintenance at that time? I was just curious about the kind of financial arrangements at, uh, with their return. Hmm. Ms. Silky can perhaps come in on this, but uh, what, what seems to have been the case, they were given a very modest allowance, um, and uh, which I think was reviewed uh, periodically thereafter. But I, I, I sense that it was, uh, I don't think the allowance was, 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 the, was the reason they went back. I don't sense it was. Right. right. So it was very modest. Yeah. Okay. Thank That's you. Certainly my, my understanding. Yeah, they, they were given houses to live in. Um, Yibang Zha definitely had the nicest of the houses, but that, that was something they had used when, when they were during the colonial era. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Julia Lee's house, her and Yibu's house was uh, very traditional Korean. Uh, she, had to, she, she had a bathtub installed so that she could take a proper bath and uh, the, uh, she had the kitchen modified so that she could cook the way she knew how to cook. Uh, but it was a very modest, small apartment, part of the Naksanje complex of apartments. Uh, but I think they lived there rent free and mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. utilities may have been picked up by the palace grounds thing. I don't know, but uh, yeah. Um, Iku continued working as an architect and making a living doing that. Uh, Julia and, and Ivan Jha both had uh, handicraft stuff that they made and sold. Uh, there was a, a, a big uh, shop in the, was it the, was it the Hilton Hotel on Namsan or uh, anyway, something like that where lots of people flocked to buy those sorts of things. Um, uh, there certainly wasn't any hidden money from the royal coffers that she was operating right, on. That's, right. that's pretty sure that uh, they, they lived pretty modest lives. In fact, Yvonne Jha's car was a very small, compact. She did have a driver, but mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. it was just a small, you could barely get four people in the car kind of a thing uh, when, when I knew her in the late 70s. So, okay, Thank you very much. Ms. Nam, you're doing research on the Anglican church in the early 20th century. Now that would coincide with the colonial era. Was the Anglican church able to do social welfare work? Were they collaborators with the Japanese authorities in Seoul at the time? What, what was going on with all that? <laughs> yeah. Um, as far as I'm aware, yeah, the, the Anglican Church in Korea, yeah, had to collaborate with the Japanese colonial government because at the time the authority was, <laughs> yeah, was the, the colonial government. But the compared to the Salvation Army in Korea, the Salvation Army in Korea was more collaborative more collaborate rather than the Anglican church because I don't know why. So it was one of my curiosity I want to investigate, but yeah. Yeah, but yeah, that's a, because of the co political situation, yeah, they had to be <laughs> a collaborator. Yeah, there's, there's uh, I think there's probably two different issues there. Mm -hmm. um, we'll look forward to a lecture from you next spring. How about that? Um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry because um, I need to. I need to do field work <laughs> this September. Since this September, um, yeah, okay. I will keep your your question and then <laughs> investigate later. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Laura, go ahead. Unmute. Hello, 
uh, thank you so much for your lecture. It was very interesting for me. I didn't know anything uh, about this topic, so thank you very much. Um, I'm a historian and I'm working on the history of juvenile reformatories. And in this sense, I had a question about the, the children themselves that were um, being cared for in those um, educational facilities. And I was wondering if you have any sources on them, if there are maybe any personal case files left, and if we know anything about their experience or um, how, yeah, how, how their experience was in these um, special care um, educational facilities. Well, th thank you, Laura. I think, I think that's a really, a, a really good and important question. And perhaps Sophie could pick up. I mean, my thoughts on that would be um, the, the narrative that we have is very much from those sources. And, and I think you know, how these children felt and their experience, I think could be a really interesting future area. I mean, presumably some of them are, are still alive. And um, I mean, you're probably aware, Laura, that you know, the whole, in the United Kingdom, the whole issue of care homes is, is extremely controversial. And you know, places like you know, Dr. Bernardes have had to address some of those controversies in their past as charities. So, um, you know, if, if there are specific records or oral history, I think that could be very, very, very interesting. And, and, and actually, you know, looking at the dynamic of her involvement with the children, my reading everything that I have, it, she does seem to have been very hands on with it. She visited the schools regularly. You know, she wasn't the sort of, um, you know, passive person. She was hands on. But I mean, Sorky, did you have any thoughts on, on that? I mean, in terms of, you know, records of the children themselves and their experiences of, of, of the two foundations? So Laura, uh, are you interested in the colonial eras or contemporary eras? Um, both maybe, depending on, on the sources that you have. I was just curious about the children and um, not only about the experiences maybe, but, but also more general, like who, who are they? Which classes are they coming from? How do they get to these educational facilities? Um, who, who, yeah, who are these children basically also? Hmm. Yeah, I I don't know much about that, but um, in the in the early 1960s or um, until the 1980, the Ibang Jas social welfare activity was quite very um, meaningful because at the time it was very little awareness of disabled or child care in Korea. So I think at that time, the, the facilities for the children was um, created and produced by the government rather than the, the private sector. So you could uh, investigate the official government documents <laughs> rather than the, yeah, digging out the private sector's yeah, source, sources. Is there any way to access the records of the foundations that Ivan Jha set up? I directly visited that uh, Jahe school and the Myeonghiwon because uh, um, until now, um, there are a few articles on social welfare activities by Ivan Jha. There are two or three written in Korean, but it was not um, in-depth research, I think. Yeah. So. Okay. It could. I mean, it could. It could be that there is material there, and, and you know that could be. I think the next stage of, of this project. Um, I mean, the foundation for the physically disabled. It was. I think it really was first come, first served. Uh, my sense is that with the school that could be more interesting in terms of, you know, who was in the know, you know, who, who was selected to go there. But, um, you know, I, I think that I, I think could be a very interesting, you know, in, in, in the next stage, next stage of this. And, you know, I, I was quite keen to point out, it did seem to be a very much a sort of one woman show in a, in a way. I mean, the foundations remained viable after her death, but, you know, these weren't a huge network of schools. They're two foundations and, uh, I, you know, that, that perhaps is significant in itself. Thank you, Laura. That's a really interesting, interesting question.
Yeah. Thank, thank you for your answer. Thank you so much. No, and I, I think I'd just say, you know, the whole, you know, releasing the, the uh, back to the UK situation, releasing the records of care homes is a, is a particularly um, live issue, uh, shall we say. You know, a lot of people are very keen to find out what, what, what took place in these homes. Mm. Very important. Well, thank you very much for your lecture tonight, Cameron. We really appreciate uh, your joining us. Ms. Nam, thank you for joining us too. And thank you for helping Cameron try to pronounce Korean. Uh, that is a task that is very difficult, isn't it? <laughs> it's a challenge to learn how to get your tongue wrapped around some of the fanatics. A um, couple of announcements. The Literature Club will meet next week, Thursday, July 22nd at 7.30 p.m. It's online. And they will be considering Ha Song Nan's Bluebeard's First Wife. It's a novel. Um, our next lecture in two weeks time on July 27th will be by me. Um, and I'm not going to read my bio here because I'm me. Uh, but I, um, uh, from childhood, have had a very inter big interest in num numismatics, uh, numismatics, uh, coin collecting, money collecting. And uh, I, uh, in searching for a hobby to do during the pandemic, I began to collect Korean banknotes from the 1890s until the present time. And so I've taken quite an interest in that. And I'm going to uh, share uh, some of the interesting stories that can be found uh, looking at Korea's banknotes over the last approximately 100 years or so. And uh, dealing with early Chosun, with the Korean Empire, the Japanese colonial era, and then of course the modern Republic of Korea. Please check out our website and our YouTube channel where you can find recordings of past lectures. This lecture will be posted within a few days and uh, you'll be able to find that if you want to review it. Um, we uh, hope to see you in two weeks at my lecture. Thank you all very much. Have a good night and a good day to uh, maybe Ken needs to have a cup of coffee or go to bed in Texas this morning. Uh, <laughs> since it's what, like four o'clock or five, he may have fallen asleep. Ken, are you still with us? Yes, I'm here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I hope you have a good day today. Oh, thank, thank you, you all. Have a very good thank evening. So good night. Good day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.